In 2021, the average number of advertisements that a person saw in one day was between six and 10,000. And most of those advertisements used photography to communicate something to you about who you should be, how you should think, what you should wear, how you should spend your money. And they often reinforce harmful stereotypes based on race, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, ability, and more. But while photography can be used against you, it can also be used by you and for you in order to interrupt those social norms and reclaim one's own sense of identity. So I want to start this talk with a photograph that I took of my mother just weeks after she had had surgery for pancreatic cancer. It marks a significant shift in the trajectory of my research, but it's also the kind of photograph that you're not likely to see in public. My mother was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer on a Wednesday, and by Monday she was in surgery. She had been in pain for some time, and the doctors were testing her, but not enough. And she continued to push and push. At one point, she was told she was just in a tizzy over nothing. But she did push for that last test, and when it came back positive, it was pancreatic cancer. So she survived surgery, but it was not without complications. And after a blood clot sent her into a 14-hour long surgery, she came out and was not able to communicate easily for months. And this was really hard for me, because before this, we talked on a regular basis, almost every day, long, winding conversations, long walk talks. That's what we call them. And so one day, after not hearing her voice for some time, I looked in the mirror and I saw her reflection. And it's not just because we looked alike, we do look alike, uh, but it was because I saw the same look on my mother's face that I, I'm sorry, I saw the same look on my face that was on my mother's face when her mother was dying. I saw the exhaustion, the dark circles under my eyes, and the uncertainty. And even though we couldn't communicate verbally, it was a way of communicating our family story. My mother's illness and my grandmother's death were both embodied in my face. So when I went to Illinois to visit my mother in the hospital eventually, uh, I didn't know what to do with myself, and so I took pictures. I took a lot of photographs, and I annoyed everyone. My family, the doctors, the nurses. But my mother, who has been my faithful collaborator since I was 16, never wavered. And so I took the, those rolls of film back to Texas, where I had just started an MFA program in photography, and I developed the film. And I showed everyone. I showed everyone and anyone who would look. And I was so shocked by the reactions. People didn't understand what to say. They didn't know how to be around me. They very rarely looked me in the eye. And I became really hungry to understand why this was happening. Why couldn't people look at these pictures? And shortly after that, I met a woman named Suzanne. Suzanne was 48 years old, and she had a seven-year-old daughter. And she had been diagnosed with stage 3B inflammatory breast cancer the week before we met. We committed to each other almost immediately. We had a really wonderful connection, and we were both hungry to tell this story. I was hungry to understand my mother's experience, and Suzanne wanted a record of her transformation for her daughter, in case her daughter ever went through this as well. She also wanted something that she could reflect upon later to understand all the changes she went through. So Suzanne and I worked together for a long time, and I went to doctor's appointments, I was in surgeries, I went to birthday parties, family gatherings, I slept over, and the result of all this work was a series of photographic diptychs called blood work. And through the, these photographic diptychs, I hoped to communicate what I learned with Suzanne and also about my mother's experience. Number one, long-term illness is cyclical. 
And people who experience long-term illness often have guilt. And it's not just because they feel that they might be a burden to those that they love, but because when they're in public, they become acutely aware that they remind everyone of their own mortality. Number two, there are very few places where people experiencing long-term illness can be themselves. And the two places that primarily operate in that way are home and hospital. And these two institutions are designed to give you strength, and simultaneously, they heighten vulnerability. And lastly, I learned that there was very little space in public for these complicated stories of death and illness. And that leads to shame and isolation. So my mother and Suzanne both survived their experiences of cancer. And six years after my mother's surgery, I birthed my first daughter, Margaret. This is one of the first photographs taken of us after she was born. And it also marks a shift in my work. Not a change so much as a deepening. And one of the things that I love about this photograph, which was an accident, my father was, uh, arrived in the, in the <laughs> birthing room about 15 minutes after I delivered her, and his phone was accidentally set to black and white, which really worked out for me as a photographer. <laughs> um, but what I'm so fascinated by when I look at this picture is not just the bond between my daughter and I, which is happening, but if you take a look at the small instrument peeking out from under my arm, I realize that despite having an out-of-hospital birth, this marks the beginning of my daughter's medicalization. So I labored for 12 hours before Margaret joined us on this side of the world. And when that was over, I was confronted with the placenta. <laughs> they call it the afterbirth, but believe me, it is very much a part of the birth. <laughs> so I was amazed by this organ that my body made. I had never seen anything like this. I was shocked by its size and its density. Nobody had ever told me that it was an organ or that my body might make one someday. And so I asked the doula to take that organ and put an imprint onto a sheet of paper so that I could have a visual record of this magnificent thing that I created. That piece would eventually lead to the first photograph in my series, Matrilinear. I learned just how silenced birth stories are in our culture by being pregnant out in public. <laughs> People would come up to me breathless, eager to tell me about their experiences, often afraid that they might be cut off before they finished what they were saying. And they were often revealing traumas to me, even if we didn't know each other. Their stories of birth had been shaped by doctors and nurses, medical practices, medical institutions, and trends at the time. And it took me a while to understand that these people weren't trying to scare me. Nobody was trying to rain on my parade. They just wanted to be heard. They just wanted to tell their story. Because what you learn from birthing, from mothering, is an incredible amount, but nobody categorizes this as critical knowledge. We are in a society that sentimentalizes motherhood while rolling their eyes at the people who are mothering. So I expanded matrilinear to include objects and items that have been passed down through generations of women in my family mostly clothing that held no monetary value, but embodied or possessed an invisible story. Through these images, I tried to visualize a body that was long gone. Even if the person who once occupied this space was still alive, their body has transformed. It no longer fits in this clothing. I use the tears and the stains and the thread in order to heighten that sense, who this person was, 
the space that they occupy. These items of clothing were once held close to their body for protection and comfort. I also use a needle and thread to tell stories that have been passed down to me as family lore. The needle and thread can point, it's a, it's a tool that can point to a location on the body, but it's also a powerful metaphor for mending. A needle can heal an object, and simultaneously in doing so, it creates a tear. When it's used on clothing, it's not so painful. <laughs> but when it's used on the skin, it can be incredibly so. So this needle and thread, it's not only a familial object, but also a medical instrument. Sometimes these pieces are about a specific story, and other times they're about patterns of stories. This piece in particular, uh, this is a pair of shorts that my grandmother made for me when I was small. And I sorted through these objects like any other ritual and caregiving, uh, they, like laundry. I, I felt the fabrics and I smelled them in order to create this cross-generational conversation. And so here I was holding this pair of shorts that had once fit my body, made by my grandmother, and I was immediately made aware of my daughter's body. When I was little, I had an incredibly difficult time keeping my knees clean. Uh, I always came home scraped and bruised, and so does my daughter, especially at the time, because she was three. And her caregivers always apologized to me. They'd say, oh, I'm so sorry, she's so battered and bruised. And I'd be like, she had a great day. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> so through this work, I also use the language of a visual archive because I want to assert that this is knowledge, that the experiences of caregiving and care itself comprise research, that this should be studied and not hidden away. So I'm primarily interested in stories of birth, death, illness, and recovery. I find that these are the stories that help us understand who we really are. They shape identity. They reveal the traumas and the experiences that create a legacy. So this is a piece that I made about my grandfather's death. And I find that these stories, they shift according to context. So this piece is called Merck's Manual, and it's a medical textbook, but I've, re I've removed some of that text in order to put my own family story in place, to bring it into proximity to the scientific trend that was happening at the time to the research that was happening far away from this family experience. So my grandfather died just days before Christmas when my father was 11 years old. He went to the hospital feeling incredibly ill but not knowing why. And it turned out during surgery they discovered that he had stomach cancer. But he actually died of a sulfa allergy. So he had a heart attack. And at the time, sulfa was a miracle drug. And there was no way to know that he had an allergy to it. So when I visit the doctor's office, that story helps me understand my risk factors. It's a clinical story. And it's, it's critical, too. But when my father tells the story, it's his story of loss. It reveals the missing part the missing piece to a long, long life. When I tell this story to my daughters, it's a story about their ancestors. It tells them about a life-changing experience that shaped their grandfather, who shaped their mother, who will shape them. So my mother, during her long career, fought for storytelling to be taken seriously, for it to be considered research, and a subjective endeavor. 
In particular, she once wrote, when we view research as a story we tell, which it inevitably is, we can see that a researcher's personal life and research are interactive. The stories we construct about others reflect the stories we construct about ourselves. So here I am, and I recognize that I am bombarded by thousands of photographs a day, but I use photography to reclaim my own imagination and my own story. I hope to create space in public for these messy and complicated conversations, because inevitably, when I share my work or I lecture about it, I am approached by people who are just dying to share. I hear birth stories. I hear stories about parents raising children, and they have to keep it private in order to succeed in public. But those stories are very real, and they have a deep impact on their life and identity. So I'd like to end this conversation where it began, with a photograph of my mother. This is a piece from my ongoing body of work, Darkness and Nothing More, in which I'm investigating the nighttime landscape of love and labor. And I've been photographing my mother now for almost three decades, and I consider this one of the most complete and complex images I've ever made of her. <laughs> because the shadow on the wall doesn't just reveal the shape of her face, it's also the silhouette of my grandmother. So here we all are again, together, visualized in one place and embodied by each other. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>